Welcome to this week's OK at Work with myself, Sarah Sawyer, and my colleague, Russell Berger, both attorneys at Offit Kerman. And today we are talking about internships. So as we head into the summer, you know, springtime, um, not to say that internships don't happen year round, but often people are looking at summer internship programs and, um, you know, when people are off break from school or in between high school and college. So companies might be looking at trying to get an intern in for certain projects for the summer for you know various reasons. So um, obviously uh, some interns are paid, some aren't paid. There's a lot of different ways to do it. What are some things that people should be considering if they are thinking about hiring summer interns or just interns in general, Russell? Yeah, so the, you know, the first thing is you have to determine whether they're an employee or an intern. And if they're an employee, then they're gonna be owed at least the minimum wage for all hours worked. You may, uh, you know, if they work overtime, you'd owe time and a half for overtime. Um, so that's really the threshold consideration is, are they an employee, are they an intern? And the Department of Labor uh, has a test for that called the primary beneficiary test. And there's some variations of this throughout the country, but, you know, really what the primary beneficiary test looks at, uh, and it um, uses seven factors to, to analyze this, is who's really getting the most benefit out of this relationship? Is this somebody providing work services that the company should be paying for? Or is this someone getting an invaluable educational experience? Are they getting school credit? That sort of thing um, that it's okay that they don't get paid for because they're getting something even more valuable. Um, so I'll rattle through those seven factors very quickly um, because I think they're worth getting out on the table. But there are things like, you know, if there's a promise of compensation, then that's gonna, that factor is gonna uh, suggest the person's an employee, not an intern. Um, you know, if it looks more like training you would get in an educational environment, then, you know, that would favor, you know, uh, internship. Um, if the internship is actually itself tied to uh, formal education programs, like it's a, you get college credit or it's part, you know, it's an externship as part of a class in college, um, you know, that's an important factor, as is uh, whether you get credit. Um, uh, and uh, whether it fits in with the academic calendar. Um, in addition, one of the other factors is the duration of the internship. Is it finite? Is it open-ended? Um, and, uh, you know, additionally, whether the uh, intern's work complements rather than displaces the work of paid employees. So if you're really, you know, if the person goes back to school in, at the end of August and you have to hire someone into their job, to keep that service going, then that really looks more like employment than it does, uh, you know, an exempted internship. And then lastly, uh, the final factor that the Department of Labor con con uh, considers, as do courts, is whether the uh, intern and the employee understand what this what this really is, um, and whether it's, uh, um, you know, the the re arrangement is conducted without entitlement to any kind of payment at the conclusion of the internship. So if what what a court will do, what the Department of Labor will do, we'll throw all those factors in the pod, do a comprehensive fact analysis. We'll probably consider facts that don't neatly fit into any of those seven categories either, because this is really just throw it all into the pot. And um, based on that, we'll come up with uh, a determination as to whether the person was an employee or an intern. Um, as I often feel with these tests, especially under the FLSA, if you can't clearly make out the case that the person's an intern, the much safer thing to do is to treat them as an employee. Yeah, and some other ways to balance that risk, because, you know, just like a lot of fun things in employment law, this is a nice, fun, as you mentioned, you know, factual-based test. There's not this clear, bright, bright line rule where, like, okay, like, they're clearly an intern, they're clearly an employee. A lot of times there's this weighing that has to has to be done. Um, some, some things, though, that can help mitigate that risk also are, you know, if if they're getting school credits, like that really is, can really like establish that value that they're getting. Otherwise you will factually have to establish that value that they're getting. Um, so if they're making photocopies, answering phone calls and, you know, getting folks coffee and they're not actually, you know, and they're a, um, you know, they're a math major. I don't know that that's really going to meet the test, um, you know, just to be, to be a little extreme. Um, whereas like, you know, if they're getting someone's coffee in the morning when they come in, but they're engaged in complex, you know, drafting or whatever, using their skill set from like school, well, then you can start to make that, that, um, 
that factual case. But if they're getting credit for school and you're doing the things within the internship that allows them to get that credit, that's going to make that a lot easier than having to establish those facts. So that's definitely something to consider. And also using an internship agreement or an internship, you know, some, some type of um, written understanding with the individual uh, showing that they don't expect to get paid, what the credit is, what the, you know, what the tasks are that they're doing. Having that understanding that, that you re mentioned, Russell, in writing about, I don't expect to get paid, I'm getting credit, you know, I'm getting to, this is for my value, um, you know, establishing those things up front can also really help because where these issues tend to happen around classification and whether they're classified properly as an intern is if the intern makes an issue of the fact that they didn't get paid, right? So um, if you kind of set those things, you know, that, that's one area that, you know, that's one way that this is an issue. So the more that you can do to make sure that you're on the same page and that they are getting that value, the better off you are. Yeah, yeah, it, right. It, and I mean, I, I would say more often than not, um, in the absence of school credit, the individual is probably going to be an employee. I mean, to me, you know, I, you look at these multi-factor tasks like that, that is kind of the the cornerstone because then you can figure out the rest of the, you know, you can write your way into, well, yeah, clearly, you know, you're not going to get paid. And we all know what the arrangement is here and we can hire a lawyer and write it totally consistent with the regulations. So we can certainly write the right things. But, you know, it, it that threshold issue of is this really about school and education or is this really about, you know, having ministerial tasks taken care of in the office? Um, and I think, you know, the, the easiest, brightest line way to prove that is, well, the person's getting college credit. Of course, they're getting a, a benefit from it. Um, and and so you know, the, the word of caution is if your person's not getting uh, school credit for being the summer intern, then, you know, you really need to think long and hard before, uh, you know, you, you fail to pay that person. Yeah. And also, you know, with a stipend, a lot of times folks will do a stipend, some type of pay. It's not going to be the same as paying someone, because when we're talking about paying someone, we're talking about an hourly, you know, there's a minimum wage, right? So if they're, if they end up being an employee and they're not actually properly classified as an intern and you paid them $500 for the quarter, um, you know, for, all, for a stipend for the, them to get to, to work or whatever, you know, that's not going to, that's not going to save you in that instance. Um, we're talking, you know, more around that, that actual strict compensation of like, all right, if they're an employee, they need to make minimum wage just like any other employee. Right. So um, stipends can be still a good thing to use if someone's getting credit or if you have established that they are properly an intern. But again, you want to be really clear on what a stip like what that stipend is, that it's not wages, that it's not something you're paying them for hour, you know, per hour for work, that it's something to cover the cost of transportation or whatever it might be. So that's another thing to consider as well is that if you are going to engage with a stipend, rules should be clear there as well. Well, thanks, Russell. We'll see you next time. Thanks, Sarah.